I think early on a lot of the SBG philosophy evolved as kind of counter to all the nonsense I'd seen in the JKD world. Which I personally found just a tremendous amount of hypocrisy. And um, as a consequence, it was really important that everything I was teaching and everything we were showing could be proven and could work. And it was all about actually just doing it, forgetting all of the, the rest. And then over time, as I've become more comfortable with jujitsu and, and train more, I start to see that there are efficient technical solutions to these problems through training alive, and the jujitsu becomes, becomes more refined. But that doesn't mean that in any way, shape, or form, we as an organization have gone back to those old training methods and those old, old delivery systems. Those are still bullshit. And, and, and I think we both know that. So why do you think those are still around? Because he, whether it's good jujitsu or bad jujitsu, whether it's Henry Aikens, Hicks and Gracie, efficient jujitsu, or a, a more lucha libre, you know, mm. MMA, no gi, fast, break legs jujitsu, whatever kind of style of jujitsu it is, it's still going to work. Correct. It's going to be impressive. Correct. It's go, it, it, if the person's good enough and there's still a smaller person can dominate a larger yes. person. And so the experiment between MMA and and Benjak Silat or Wing Chun and, and that, it's, it's old. That's done. It's done. Yet it's, it's still there. Yeah. yeah. Why do you think that is? Ah, uh, wow. You know, I don't think people, and I include, I include myself in this because I'm, I'm very clear about this particular problem, but I'm sure I have my own blind spots. I don't think people are all that rational usually, and that's, that's one part of it. I mean, uh, rationally it seems to be done, but uh, a diamond is actually a rock. Right. But some people will pay $10,000 for a rock because it's this big instead of this big, you know, and it's a rock, but, you know, they, someone decided it's a valuable rock, and there's no objective value in that. It's, it's just what people project onto it and what the media tells them to project onto it. It's not quite that subjective because, you know, from, from Horian on, I mean, in America, was way before that in Brazil. From Horian on, I mean, people who wanted to know knew, right? Uh, so that kind of answers the question, doesn't it? From Horian on, people who wanted to know knew. Yeah. So ultimately, there's a large group of people who don't want to know. Right. And I and I think um, that makes martial arts more like the rest of life, not less like the rest of life. Right. Like you could apply. That to almost every like people with relationships with their you know, significant others of I mean love relationships friendships work where they work I mean a lot of a lot of people have a kind of needling uncomfortable sense of the truth but they just kind of shut it off right there and put up a firewall and never deal with it and at, I mean at their peril in martial arts it's like at your peril, if you're one of those poor karate guys who goes to UFC two and, and just gets annihilated, right. and and like, but that only takes five five minutes. That only takes two minutes. But then in life, you know, pe people spend years and years. It's much more destructive. But yeah, there are a lot of people who. Well, it's back to what I said about good jujitsu. Like you have to kind of take a couple steps back to get it. And some people aren't willing to take those couple steps back. They're, it's like, you know, well, I've, been, I've invested, and sometimes it's a month, and sometimes it's 17 years. Yeah. But in their head, it's the same thing. Like, yeah. I'm too far down this road to turn back. And right. I think people, it's, it's obviously fallacious, and you could, there's, you know, a, a really good uh, teacher outside of martial arts that I once had. He, he, you know, he his Korean lit professor. He would always say, "Better late." Like people would turn in a late paper, or they'd be like, oh, "I'm sorry, I was supposed to do it Tuesday, but I'm giving it to you Wednesday." And he'd say, "Better late," and he'd wait because they'd always be like, "Oh, then never." And he would say, "Then very late." <laughs> you know, 
forget never. Right. You know, but better late than very late. But a lot of people, like, if they're a little bit late, that the game is over. And they're, right. they're, they're afraid. And they're, I think it comes down to fear. Right. And they're afraid to uh, kind of... Afraid to let stuff go. Retool their lives, even though, it, it, even though, like I said, there's a temporary setback, but, but for huge gains. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's show some people um, some, maybe you can show some physical examples of what you would consider, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, we'll call more efficient jujitsu. Yeah. Uh, oppo as opposed to good jujitsu, but not as right. efficient as it could be. In terms of human anatomy, it's as stupid for me to punch his toes as it is for me to kick his face. I'm not talking about the outcome of a successful kick, which can be a knockout, right? I'm talking about efficiency. Uh, I would even argue the reason in, in, like, say, Taekwondo that head kicks are so prized is because they are difficult. That's a different thing. That's, that's like gymnastics or figure skating and awarding points for degree of difficulty, which is nice for a spectator sport. But if you're talking about, you know, a, a person who's not a professional athlete, not in the Olympics, trying to defend him or herself in the most efficient manner, head kicking is about as useful as punching toes. And, it's, and it's, it's inefficient and dangerous, and it leaves a lot of exposure. You recently had a chance to go back. Yes. Talk to me about that. How did that feel? What did you notice? How have things changed, if they've changed? Um, now you're talking about going back to... Back to L.A., back yeah. to... You also went back and visited some of the, the JKD yeah. schools. Yeah. So uh, I'm not uh, really well-versed with the whole scene. I, I was limited to the Inosano Academy, and I went back, and uh, to me, it appeared like they are true to their mission. They are doing what they've always done. And so, you know, again, I, I don't, I'm not a missionary, and I'm not trying to proselytize or convert people. But for me, I saw it, and I thought, this is wonderful. It's wonderful to go back and say hello to Dan and, and see people there. But I also realized that I drifted in my direction for a reason, and that reason hadn't changed. And you know, I, I it felt um, on on a personal level, it felt wonderful to go and, and pay my respects. But um, as far as a martial artist, I didn't feel drawn to what was happening. You're in kind of a unique position. So I was thinking about what we talk about. There's not many people who have, been, have done jujitsu for as long as you have. Right? Uh, there's not many people who have tr had an opportunity to train with Hicks, and, and, and recently you've been training, I know, with Henry Aikens, and there's some you know, video of you and Henry online that's, that's great. And, um, and you've also trained with Human Gracie. And you've also trained with a lot of other Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors. And then in addition to that, you have the background of Jeet Do concepts that a lot of the SPG coaches have. And so there's this long background where you and I can have a conversation that hard to have with other people that don't have a similar background. And so what I'd like to actually get at are what you feel a lot of the differences are. Yeah. So we went back and you said if you were living in a more dangerous society, you might be interested in training knives and firearms. Let's, take, let's set the firearms aside because we both know good instructors for firearms. Right. If you're training edged impact weapons, what approach would you take? Would that mean that you would then want to go back to your old Kali days of what you were doing? So what I'm training that? Yeah, what, what I've seen with, so I, I did travel to the Philippines a couple of times. I was lucky enough actually to train with, uh, with uh, Grandmaster Lo Street Sumo and Tony Diego, who was his head student, and then a couple still really high level guys, but under him. Um, that seemed to me quite pared down and I mean maybe they didn't pare it down. Maybe the other people pared theirs up over time. But it, it hadn't really lost its direct connection to uh, you yeah, know the train was six, you can't you can't really train hard with live swords any more than you know you can shoot each other with live ammunition. But they were they were pretty close to, I mean, they were, they were keeping it as realistic as possible. I mean, that, that would be something that would interest me if I, were, if I felt like I needed it on a daily basis. Um, there are, you know, I mean, it's the martial arts, so you have, we have a lot of options, and some people gravitate towards things that are a bit more flowery, and some people a bit more um, 
based on fundamentals and more direct, and that's what I would be doing if I were doing Philippine law. On defense, I often give the analogy of, of trying to block with my hands a leg kick. So a leg kick is really efficient from his perspective because he's using his lower body to attack my lower body, and it hurts, right? So the worst, although still common in a lot of traditional martial arts, way to deal with that is he does that, and I do this. Now, the problem is if he has a good leg kick, I just broke my arm. If he has a bad leg kick, my arm hurts a little bit, he throws it, he fakes it, or throws it one more time, and he hits me with the right hand, because I'm down here, and I get knocked out. So it's objectively inefficient for many different reasons. I think people get that. But then when he lays down and we do jujitsu, partially because of the gi, a lot of people wind up doing something that looks very similar. It's my arms trying to dominate his legs. And that's about as efficient as a down block against a low kick. Not that it won't work sometimes, but it's inefficient. And it leaves me open to a lot of problems. The first problem is his legs are a lot stronger than my arms. So without a gi, it's almost impossible. Like I'll never be able to hold him without a gi. With the gi, I may hold him for a while, but I'm getting, he, yeah, he can re-grip, he can break, and even if I hold him, I'm getting extremely tired. Now, let's say he's 150 pounds and I'm 250 pounds. Already, we're, we're straying away from efficiency on one level because I, I'm just bigger and stronger. So I'm able to do this, but look where I am. My hands are now occupied, let me face the camera. My hands are now occupied holding his legs. They cannot lock in his upper body, let alone try to choke or arm lock him, which really is my final goal, is, is to find a submission. This is jujitsu, right? And so the mo he can wait here, yeah, frame, and the moment I, I detach, I have to start over again. By definition, objectively, that is inefficient. When did you first come to SBG? I don't quite remember. The funny thing is, SBG and Jiu Jitsu in general are the same for me. So I saw Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Horian, who was the main guy at the time, indirectly in Helsin through my friend. Right. And I saw you indirectly through magazines and videos, and Burton Richardson's early articles about yeah. what SBG was doing. Steve, right? Steve Weaver. Okay, so that's, but that's even late. Oh, okay. So like I had, the only reason <coughs> Steve got me to show up, so, so yeah, let me back up. So I was already, uh, aware of SPG and I already agreed with the things you were writing and the things people like were writing about you and I'm like yes of course and you know we're both coming out of a JKD environment looking right. for something a bit more functional and so when Steve said hey I'm bringing Matt Thornton out and there before the seminar starts there's a private on Friday and I get one other guy do you want to be that guy and I'm just like yeah of course yeah. I'm that guy so by the time we met, uh, just like by the time I moved to train with Hickson, I was already a couple, few years into thinking about it yeah. and, and dealing with those concepts without direct instruction. And then uh, we met and we got along and I told you I was moving to Chico to open a martial arts school. And you're like, my dad's in Chico. Right, right. And it kind of flowed naturally from there. Yeah. So one thing we were talking about earlier, um, a lot of our students now, so that was that was almost 20 years ago. Correct. Right. So in the interim, we've had multiple generations of students. Uh, my black belts have black belts. And they those students have no exposure to that. Yes. So a lot of times, the aliveness conversation and what we talk about as far as distinctions in, in epistemologies don't resonate with them in the same way because they learn immediately stuff that wasn't bullshit. Right. And... I still believe that there's an importance to the conversation because those things become easily lost. Right. Those arguments become forgotten. And just because someone's been exposed only to functional martial arts doesn't mean if, if they don't know how the other, for lack of a better term, tricks work, right. that they can't be confused. Correct. And, uh, and, and wander off in, into nonsense and then pretty soon we're back to yes. sclerotic patterns. So um, I wonder how that affects your teaching, or if it affects your teaching, if you think about that now, you have a whole generation, you have, how many black belts do you have? 
My black belts are black belts, like yeah. you. Um, and I haven't counted, although I sent a list to Zach. Conservatively, 20? Right. Yeah. So you have 20 black belts, and they all have students. So there's yes. this whole group of people that really don't know what it was like right. different before we did what we did. So yes. how do you think, do you think it's an, it matters? It's and, absolutely important. Okay. Uh, I like to think and teach in analogies, and this is one I've never thought of, even though we've had this conversation before, but I think of it maybe like raising children. Yeah. How do you balance uh, not making them needlessly go through the hardships you went through, but also not making them entitled spoiled brats? Right. Right? And that's kind of what we're doing with our jiu-jitsu suit. And I don't want to artificially force them into doing weird things, like hazings and rituals so that they know what we had to do. Right. But at the same time, they can be a bit entitled, like, oh, it's always been this way, and it hasn't always been this way. Um, so, I guess, yeah, it's, it's not easy. I'm, I'm trying to think of, of, like... Do you still talk about, for example, aliveness in a class? No. Okay. No. But then, there's a Korean context. And although a lot of my students uh, might benefit from that, they're kind of, uh, it's changing. But my first generation students, like us, they weren't coming from JKD, but they were coming from Taekwondo and they were coming from Hapkido. And so they had the same epiphanies that we had. So it wasn't necessary. They just, they saw it. More importantly, they felt it. And it was game over and I'm with you for life, and this works, and what I did before didn't work. And you know, the other ones stuck their head in the sand, and they don't become your students. They stick their head in the sand, and they, they pretend that it doesn't work. But the ones who uh, got it, got it for real, mm -hmm. and kind of uh, left everything behind, and, and we're all in. But now, it's new, so I'm, I'm, it's, it's timely that we're having this conversation, because there's a second generation who uh, just started with us, and, and so... Basically, the things you've been thinking about for seven, eight, nine years, I've been thinking about for one or two years, right? Because we're a little bit behind the curve, uh, and I'm a little bit still more first generation. But it's important, and I, I need to think about it, but I, I would go back to, to analogies about how do you instill the right values in your students or children without you know, needlessly inflicting uh, you know, stupid suffering on them, whether it's bad training in the gym or just, you know, bad training in the home. You know, and then I guess that's, that's a project that I'm still sort of working through. Okay. With jiu-jitsu, you've had a, a unique opportunity. You've trained a lot of different jiu-jitsu black belts. And then, as I said um, a few minutes ago, recently you've been training more, for lack of a better term, Hickson's lineage. Yes. And, and SPG as a whole, is, it, our mission statement has really been about fundamentals and that epistemology, and uh, from Chris Howard and uh, Hickson. And there really is a difference in, in the distinction in technique. And one of the things I found interesting since you arrived here on this particular trip, and you come here all the time, and it's always, I always learn great things from you, but you were talking about you're very picky with your jiu-jitsu these days yes. after doing jiu-jitsu for 20 years. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the difference. Okay. So, yeah, I'll, I'll work backwards. I am... I have gotten picky, and I, I felt like I wanted everyone to have fun and everyone to like me, and I still feel that way to a certain degree, but I, but I never felt that way like in the university classroom. I'm like, you don't have to like me. I'm, I'm not here to make you like me. I'm here to teach you. Right. Um, and I've, I've, I've come to that realization in jiu-jitsu as well, and I, I spend a lot of time and energy and money trying to find the best jiu-jitsu in the world and then give that jujitsu to my students. And, and when people aren't doing it, I'm not doing them any sort of service by sort of letting it slide. And I used to just think, well, it's OK. I don't want to offend anyone. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's important to be offensive, but it's important to be honest. Right. So I, I have become, and I remember one thing I really remember about Hickson versus other teachers I've had is he was quite interventionist. And I think that's good. It took, me a, it took me 20 years to come back around. But he wouldn't let things slide. And I think some other teachers do. So it'll work itself out organically. And it's OK to do that because you'll learn not to do it. 
It's not always the case. And uh, Hickson would, would grind a class to a halt and say, that's not jujitsu. It's not my jujitsu. It's not something you learned here. And people would either say sorry or they would attempt to say something very ignorant like, but I tapped him or it worked. And he'd say, you know, that's not what I said. I didn't, I didn't say it. you didn't make it work today this one time. I said it wasn't jujitsu. Totally different things, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of coming to that as well. My job is, is not to, uh, you know, we've talked about this a lot. A lot. It's not to take phenomenal athletes who may have done a bunch of judo and wrestling and teach them a kimura and have them beat people. It's to teach people jujitsu. And when they're not doing jujitsu, I do intervene. Now, more specifically to your question, uh, yes, there's a difference. Um, there are, there are two ways to divide this. There, there are people, because jiu-jitsu is popular and it's a way to make money, there are people who really don't know any jiu-jitsu claiming they do. That's an easier problem. Those people, the internet kind of takes care of them. They get over for a week or a month or a year, and then they get sorted. So that's not my job. The more insidious version, not insidious, but the, the harder to spot and harder to correct version is they are doing authentic jujitsu in the sense that they have a lineage and they're not lying. They, they did get promoted. It's like they didn't self-promote. They didn't buy their belt. Uh, you know, they, they really have an instructor. But, you know, and this is subjective, but from my point of view, what they're doing is poor jujitsu. And uh, is it subjective? It's, it is subjective in the sense that it, it, it's subjective in the sense that someone who didn't share my philosophy could argue that it's, it's not bad based on results. It's right. not subjective between the two of us, but it's subjective that they could say, but he won a world championship, or you know, his students won a world championship. It's not subjective if you were to define it by efficiency. Correct. But even, that, even those discussions break down because some people haven't, they, haven't, they, haven't, they don't know enough jujitsu to, to know what I'm arguing. Right. That doesn't mean they're right, though. No, no, not at all. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but they're not lying to me. Right. Or they know in their head they're wrong, but they're being stubborn. Right. They believe they're right because they haven't seen the jujitsu that I've seen. And so... So that brings it full circle. Yeah. Because we hear all these stories of, of uh, Hickson when he was in his 40s and world champions coming in and the differences in movement. And, the, and there's kind of two camps. There's one camp of people who've experienced that. Uh, and a lot of the old, older generation, we're kind of old, and then there's my coach, Chris Howden, was one of the first 12. He trained with Hickson back like a lot of those guys did when he was a white belt and a blue belt. They all kind of know, yes. and if you talk to them, they're very deferential about Hickson's jujitsu and what he was offering. And we kind of know, and then there's a whole generation of people that I think maybe don't anymore. Right. And even with my generation, and we've talked about this before too, is... is there was some secrecy on the Gracie Correct. part, especially from Corian, yeah. as it relates to not giving techniques out. And, and there was a little bit of secrecy back in the day, right? Correct. With not wanting the MMA fighters to necessarily get jujitsu and this yes. kind of thing. And that kind of backfired in a way where earlier, early on in my career, I, I kind of had a, a little bit of resentment about that. Mm -hmm. I think and we all did. We all yeah. did. And it made me question a little bit that maybe they were holding things back. Yeah. And then in retrospect, as time has passed, I look back and, and I've seen a lot of wisdom to what Horian was doing and gone back and, and reviewed and like we both talked about jiu-jitsu that we love is white belt jiu-jitsu. Yes. The Oompa and my mouth curriculum that I was teaching last year, a lot of it was some first Gracie in action tapes with, yes. with Horian because of that material. But um, that's this kind of divided jiu-jitsu and there's a lot of very competent black belts that I'm familiar with who don't believe, they don't, for lack of a better term, don't buy into that. Right. Uh, a story about Hickson. What would you? I know you're going to show us some of the techniques here today and kind of show us differences in how they would be applied, which would be great. But um, how would you explain the difference to someone who is familiar with jujitsu but right. doesn't hasn't felt it, doesn't believe it yet? Right, right. I got to roll with Hickson maybe five times during the year that I spent there, and people asked me all the time. I was a white belt and a blue belt, and at the time it was kind of magic. It's like, Hickson is in front of me, Hickson is behind me. I'm tapping. I don't know what happened. Had I been in a brown belt or a black belt, the same thing would have happened, but I would have learned more from it because I would have been more conscious of how he was getting from A to B without me knowing it. I would have kind of known, like, oh, 
this is what he's doing, I can't stop it, but I'm learning from it, right. and I can emulate it. I didn't have that, I, just, I didn't have vision, and jujitsu is you know, a process of expanding your vision. And, uh, but, but going back and training with Henry, uh, I, I see so many of those missing pieces, and uh, it's, it's, God, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's a different approach. It's, it is really... A connection-based approach. Yeah, it's based, it is based on connection, and it's based on certain uh, principles, unchanging principles. And, you know, it actually, I think the, there are two reasons why people don't get it. One is the reason you already gave. They're young, and they've never been exposed to it. There are two either in the family tree or in terms of chronology, they're distant from it. And that's not anyone's fault. Right. I mean, that's not the individual student's fault. The one that people have to take more responsibility for, and, and there are people in your gym and people in my gym, and, and by the way, we talked about this, people in Henry's gym. You know, one weekend, someone's flying Henry to some foreign country to pay him a lot of money to teach jiu-jitsu, and then he comes back, and guys don't want to take his class. Right. You know, so, I mean, it's weird. But... The, that's the thing that individual students have to, to take responsibility for is that, is that there is a leap of faith that's necessary. That you have to believe in jiu-jitsu as a technical system, not a system of maybe if I, if I can bench more, uh, run faster, you know, do more CrossFit, do whatever it is that you see some of these athletes doing. It's, it's sad, but you know, you'll watch a, a, a tape of a famous jiu-jitsu guy getting ready for a fight, and if it's a little like three minute trailer, you get like 30 seconds of jujitsu and two and a half minutes of CrossFit looking stuff, you know, and how big their pecs are and how much weight they can lift. And there's guys that just believe that. And so there, there is, you have, you have to step away from your physicality, especially if you're a young man and you're a good athlete, and you have to totally believe in and immerse yourself in uh, a technical system, which you know, we talked about this as well, may mean a temporary setback in terms of winning and losing in the gym, or even winning and losing in a tournament. Mm -hmm. You know, somewhere between, let's say, six months and a year, where your, your performance as, as gauged externally in little tin metals drops. Mm -hmm. But that will result in a huge and otherwise unattainable gain in terms of your jiu-jitsu. But a lot of people, in terms of ego or coach, it may be them internally ego, externally their coach doesn't uh, enforce this enough or some, probably a combination usually. Coach doesn't really know or believe it and they don't want to take that hit and so it, it doesn't happen that much but, you know, um, I just heard it from enough people, high, high level people that I trust and then felt it myself. I think you're going to be showing some of it today. Yeah, I felt, felt it myself that, that it is uh, qualitatively a different jiu-jitsu than most of what's out there. Right. What are my other options? Just like stand back up, just like good kickboxing would be dealing with his upper body with my upper body, and if a leg kick comes in, dealing with it right here and being ready to fire back. It's anatomically correct. It's safe, it's efficient. So why do jiu-jitsu any other way? I'm going to try to avoid his legs, not dominate them, and then use my upper body to lock in his upper body. And only now, once I'm here in a good position, I'll deal with his legs, but it won't be with my arms. My arms are part of my upper body, so they deal with his upper body. Whatever he does with his legs, put in a butterfly hook, I will deal with, with my legs, a knee shield. I will deal with his lower body with my lower body. And this is not a matter of technique. There are techniques I can teach from here. This is a matter of structure and, and objective efficiency. Uh, we are now doing what human beings should do, which is you know use our bodies the way they're designed to be used. And if, if you look at uh, what I consider Good jujitsu, the kind of jujitsu where, uh, as we discussed earlier, a smaller person can beat a bigger person, or a weaker person can beat a stronger person. It's not going to be me using the weakest joints and muscles in my body, which are my fingers, 
to try to get a death grip on the strongest part of his body, which, which are his legs. This, this, even if it works, uh, works for the wrong reasons, uh, and, and it simply isn't efficient. And if I fail to do it once, and I fail to do it twice, there's also a really high price in terms of energetics. So there's the energy I expend for that 30 seconds in failing, but there's the energetics of a fight. I really clearly remember he used to say, I tell you we're sparring for three minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because we have a class, you need to take a shower and go home. But if you, when you spar in your mind, you should think, if this guy's careless, I'm gonna arm lock him in one second. If he's good, we may be entangled for an hour. And you have to, you have to approach jujitsu every time you slap hands with someone and start rolling, that this could go an hour. You go too soft and you tap because he's attacking you. But you go too hard and he defends and then you tap later because you've gassed out. So in all these positions, it's not simply, uh, you can't slice it and say, this one slice, this one frame worked one time, you know, and I got around it. It's more like, how much energy is this going to take? Can I do it repeatedly, like a scientific experiment? And when I fail, because we're not doing fantasy martial arts, we're doing jiu-jitsu, and he's a black belt, and I'm going to fail. I'm not, I'm not going to walk through everyone's guards. When I fail, am I ready to recompose and keep fighting for another 59 minutes, for hour and 59 minutes. And that's really what I, what I think, uh, in some ways, defines good jiu-jitsu. Another one would be, once we pass guard, let's say we mount it. Yeah, it's right here. I mount it, and again, I'm not talking about a, a, a black belt fighting an inexperienced person. I'm talking about a black belt fighting a black belt. If he starts going for the elbow escape, for example, and go on the other side so the camera can see it. And I'm trying to dig this out, and I'm trying to dig this out and pluck the elbow and things like that. It may work, but there's an element of arm wrestling because his jiu-jitsu is good and he's connected. He's not floating anywhere. He's connected to my hip. He's connected to the ground. He's connected. This doesn't feel very good. And again, let's say he outweighs me by 30 pounds, right? And I don't have a gi. And even if I have a gi, even with the gi, this is arm wrestling. This is arm wrestling. Without a gi, it's not going to work. And a lot of times, I wind up, just do the elbow escape, I wind up giving him time to do his move. Because even if he sat there for 30 seconds and I can do it, I may not be able to do it in the 2 seconds, sorry, 1.5 seconds, it took for a real black belt to be from here to putting me in guard. So, here too, rather than using a weaker part of my body to arm wrestle with him, the moment he goes from here across, go, go in slow motion so I can show them, he can't elbow escape from here. He's gonna choose a hip, right? And I know that. If he's only here, he's not vulnerable to the technique I'm gonna do, but I can start attacking. If he goes to that hip, I can drop my whole body on that arm. And it's trapped. Now, it really is trapped. You feel like you can do much. And it's not that I'm using my hands. My hands are free. And from here, take your hand out. It's going to be very hard. It's not that it won't happen. Really take it out. It will take him a couple seconds. And two things happen. Three things happen. He's, he's wasted energy removing that hand because it's kind of like weightlifting. Uh, he's given up on the elbow escape. So we're back to a point where I can attack again. And if I get good enough at stuffing his hand, I'm also attacking him. So the removing the hand is kind of an artificial game we can play. But later when he goes, I'll be trapping and underhooking. And already as he tries to remove his hand, he choking. And again, this isn't a technique video, but from, from uh, Hickson to Henry to SBG, uh, in, in all credit to, to the people who teach us, this choke done correctly is, it takes about a tenth of a second. I mean, 
It, take, it basically takes a tenth of a second more than it takes for me to put my hand in front of Coach Travis's neck. That's all it takes. It's not, it's not some of these slower chokes where he can drop his chin. And so. so again, this is efficient because now, instead of doing this, where even if I get it, I'm not attacking and I'm just giving him a second chance and a third chance. If he's a lot stronger than me, I'm not going to get it. If he doesn't have a gi, it's going to be harder. It's making my defense, when he goes, into a kind of attack. So already, I've defended, and if he wants to keep pushing the elbow escape, A, it's not going to work. B, he can't defend his neck. If he goes to defend his neck, he has one hand, because it's going to be very hard for him to get his other hand out. And it doesn't take me very long with good jujitsu, like milliseconds, to finish the fight. So I think... You know, you can't control certain variables. Jiu-jitsu uh, looks like magic to, to white belts, and sometimes it looks like magic to, to black belts as well. But the reason it's not magic is because it operates within the world of physics. Uh, and in the world of physics, uh, I need to, you know, use the largest, strongest parts of my body against the weakest parts of his body, and that's only half of the equation while also making sure I can attack, right? Or defend if I'm defending. We're, I showed an attack sequence. One wonderful thing about Hedon Grace is, you know, people will go to him and say they want to be world champions in the IBJJF. And he'll send them down the road. He'll be like, that's not what I do. That's not what the school is about. That's not what I'm about. You know, you got Cobrinha, you got Leo Vieira, and these guys are they're world, multiple time world champions. Why don't you go there? This is what we do. And that's cool. Uh, and some students want uh, health, and some students want camaraderie. And if a teacher, let's say, let's say a Filipino martial arts, because then you have knives and swords and sticks, and it, it could be quite functional in a certain sense with weapons. But if the teacher says, no, 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 this is Filipino culture, and these patterns are a good way to loosen up your shoulders and your elbows, and develop hand-eye coordination, uh, but we're not here to teach you how to fight. Like, I, I'm anti-violence, and this is just a, a kind of cultural and spiritual and health class. Then the students who want that will stay, and the students who don't will not be deluded. They'll go somewhere else. The problem is when, and this is, and, and this is every martial art, is, is when uh, people are not as honest as Hito or that hypothetical Filipino martial arts instructor, and what they're doing is not functional, and, you know, I, I watch certain uh, classes where people are clicking their sticks together, and I'm like, it would be better to play football in high school and just run and tackle someone. You would you'd be more effective in a fight with or without weapons if you just knew how to run and tackle someone really hard. That's really how unfunctional some of those things are. And so, as, so I think the problem is not whether or not people can fight and whether or not certain instructors teach you how to fight. It's if I walk into a place, uh, I walk into a restaurant, they don't, I'm a vegetarian, and they say, uh, yeah, we have that option, and then they give me a bunch of bacon. That's, that's just a lie, right? And I'm not there, I'm not getting what I went there for. I, I, I agree with you. I still think you're giving people way too much credit. And the reason why I would say that is because how, how many martial arts instructors who teach a bullshit martial art do you know that actually are honest about it? Like, when you walk into an Aikido school, have you ever seen a disclaimer on the wall that says, this is just a form of exercise and health not to be used for self-defense? So, and it's like flower arranging. Or, I'm being nice. You're being yeah, super I'm, nice. I'm being super nice. You're being super nice. I'm being super right. nice. But I think, I think the, the people who are eventually tuning into this this year and in 20 years <laughs> will understand the distinction. I hope so. But, but I, think, I think it gets lost sometimes because everybody wants to be nice. I mean, it's not nice to lie to people. And I have never run into one of those guys who says that. I've never run into a Wing Chun guy, a Wing Chun instructor, a calling instructor that says, yeah, we're just going to click sticks together because it's a great way to loosen up shoulders and I want to preserve Filipino martial arts. But if you get in a stick fight, this is all bullshit. I've never run into that. Neither have I. No. And not only that, it reminds me of 
we've had this conversation before, but um, I don't know what... I think you're an atheist, not that it matters, but I'm, I'm an atheist, and I've, I've had conversations with, with religious people, and there are religious uh, people who will argue with atheists, and to me, they will say, well, you know, really Genesis is a metaphor for this or for that, and we'll take a Joseph Campbell approach, and it all sounds very spiritual, and uh, it sounds good. And then behind closed doors, in front of the congregation, if you were to take a poll of that conversa- congregation and ask how many think Noah's Ark is a, a history report, the majority do, because he says something totally different to his congregation than he would to me or you in a debate. Right. And that's pernicious. Mm-hmm. It's not nice. Right. And also, I wonder, <clears throat> can anything really character-wise be achieved to become a better human being, if that's what we mean by the word spiritual? I think if, if it doesn't mean becoming a better human being, then to me the word doesn't mean much. Right. If it's based in dishonesty. I question that. Right, so, so I'm, I'm giving what becomes largely hypothetical, but I'm giving a largely hypothetical out right. for those rare individuals who may be in that camp. However, I would agree with you. <laughs> I haven't met any yet. No. Yeah. No, and that's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> and, and the people who, who are going to be drawn towards the bullshit martial arts for the wrong reasons will latch on to any ambiguity and hold on to that tight because they don't want to let go. Yeah. And no, I don't know if we do them any, any favors by not just being blunt. You know? Right. Right. So... Yeah, I'm struggling with this right now. <laughs> no, in, I think it's Dumb and Dumber. Is that the movie where, yeah. where he says, so there's a chance, right? Yeah. 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 It doesn't do any good. It's, it's better than nothing, but it's not good jujitsu. If he goes to elbow skate, and I do, and I get it out, you know, because I'm stronger than him, and then he goes to elbow skate on this side, and I get it out, and the next time he's kind of hip to it, so I go here, and I'm trying to do that, and he grabs me and upas me, for example. You know, and I'm going, oh, I'm just, I'm not advancing my position. I'm just giving him a chance to read my game. I'm wasting energy. I'm arm wrestling. And he's a smart guy and, and who's been doing jiu-jitsu for 20 years as well. And it, I'm gonna, it's going to work one. It might not work the first time. First of all, if he's bigger and stronger, it won't even work. He's going to elbow escape. I'll be in guard. Game over. But if it works... I've gained nothing. I've just returned to where I was, and I've lost something, which is he knows he knows a little part of my game. He's waiting for me next time, and I get upa, and I and I get reversed. So I think you know these are just a couple examples of using your body the way it's supposed to be, the way you're built. Uh, I think so many traditional martial arts do the opposite. It's like I'm a human, but I want to fight like a crane or a, or a praying mantis. Or my feet are on the floor, but I want to use them to kick someone in the face. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge macro example that everyone gets right away. But there are, as you do this longer and longer, there are micro examples. And it, it becomes uh, more and more granular and more and more detailed. And so when people say, oh, I know that. I know that choke. I know that armbar. My coach showed me that. I really believe it's because it's they haven't seen... Uh, the way that, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, the Alio Gracie lineage does it uh, in a kind of uh, big picture, and the Hickson Gracie lineage does it in a more narrow picture. Uh, they haven't seen it, and, when, and, and ironically, because they haven't seen it, sometimes they either ignore it, or when they see it, they don't, they don't even have... Uh, the ability to actually appreciate what they're seeing. It's like if, uh, if Coach Matt is off camera right now, but if, if he starts yelling at me uh, right now in uh, Swahili, it's not that what he's saying doesn't make sense. It's like I can't hear what he's saying. I think if I learned Swahili for 20 years, I'd, I'd know what he was saying. And there are a lot of people who, who do jujitsu, uh, but some of the, the really high level jujitsu is like, a language they they don't yet understand and may not understand. Uh, ironically, though, it's the opposite of foreign languages, where usually uh, they have a low-level understanding of pidgin and they don't understand really complicated arguments. 
the, the funny thing about jujitsu is oftentimes they're so involved with trying to understand and make complicated arguments that they don't understand uh, you know, how, to, how to put together the letters to make words or, or a very basic uh, grammatical structure that makes, that makes everything work uh, at every level. That was excellent. But you know, like, but you, you know, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about when I did it with Travis, but, but you know, the irony, and this is the irony, the people who don't get it are going to see what I did and be like, I know that. Yeah. I know how to hold them out. I know how to pass guard. It's kind of funny, right? Because we're almost, I, 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 I worry that we're almost preaching to the convert. Well, their students will see it. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Good point. It's like, it's people always say, the debates are pointless, arguments are pointless, they're not going to change your mind. There's 400 people watching the debate. That's who you're talking to. Okay, John, so for... People who don't know you that well, right? But you actually have a PhD from Harvard, correct? Uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's in Korean literature. Yes. And you teach at Yonsei, is that it? Yonsei. Yonsei. Yonsei yeah. Okay. One of the things that interests me, and, and we've talked about this before, running through academia right now, certain segments of academia, distinctions between better and best and, and good and right and wrong start. They want to erase a lot of those distinctions. Yes. I wonder, now in your field, it's empirical. Yes. Okay. And there are, you have your peer-reviewed journals. Correct. And if you put forward an argument, or, or one of your peers does, and it's wrong, how do you approach that? Yeah. So when I graduated, this was a question. And the, the dean, uh, we're there, we're getting our doctorate degrees, and said, you know, the guys down the road getting MDs, they're licensed to practice medicine if they go through their boards. And the guys getting JDs, if they pass the bar, they're licensed to practice law. And he said, kind of tongue-in-cheek, what are you guys licensed to do? And we all thought, like, yeah, what are we licensed to do? And he said, you're, you're licensed to create knowledge. Like, that's a, a doctor of philosophy is licensed to create knowledge. He said, but you can't just create it in your own head. You have to put out a hypothesis, subject it to peer review. You know, it, it's a scientific process, but it's, it is more subjective, I think, than that. Uh, but you, you need, uh, just to get over the first hurdle, you need three uh, people in your field uh, if it goes out to them, it means they're probably pretty influential in your field, to go over your work with a fine-tooth comb and either sign off on it, which is very rare, or to say, with these revisions that we suggest, and you get it's triangulated, three different people with the three uh, overlapping but different skill sets, telling you how to bolster it, and then you do that. And then if they're satisfied that you've uh, sort of uh, implemented the suggestions that they've made and strengthened the weaker parts of your argument, then you're in. But that's just blue belt, right? That's blue belt. Blue to black belt is like who actually talks about it after that, who re -quote, you know, who quotes you and re-quotes you and how much influence you have in the field. But it, but it is, it is uh, empirical in the sense that uh, you won't even make it over the first hurdle if, if you're weak. And after that, even if you make it that far, you'll kind of just fade off in the distance. Let me ask you another question then, or ask the question in a yeah. different way. When you find yourself critiquing uh, a peer's work and something's just objectively wrong, right. perhaps they mistranslated the text, right. or have a, is something historical wrong with it, are you worried you're going to hurt their feelings? Never. Okay. First of all, it's anonymous, which is nice, right. but, but that's not the main thing. Uh, no, it's... it's uh, it's a service to them because either, either there are really only two things. They will row or quit. So one of the criticisms I've heard about SBG in particular, and well, certainly me over the years, is that um, you know, hurting people's feelings or, or, or a, a, a just being critical of other martial arts that don't work. But you know, as we both know, some things work and some things don't. And although I've always strived to talk about delivery systems, to talk about systems of training, especially training methods, epistemologies, as opposed to individuals, we rarely ever discuss individuals. But if, if, we, if we're in a field where we can't discuss training methods, and we can't talk about things being better or worse than other things, and we have to pretend that everything is, everything is good and everything is useful, right. which is nonsense. Right then by definition you're now involved in a field that's not going to grow. It's, it's, we're not going to be able to build on the knowledge of those that came before us, really. Correct. We just wind up passing on a superstition, right. which is what happened to martial arts. Correct. And so... Well, um, I would even put a finer point on it. 
it, it, will, it will grow in an unhealthy way. Right. Right? Which is like cancer. You don't want it to grow. So I wonder sometimes when people are hesitant to talk about that. And I'll tell you a story uh, Chris Howder told me years ago. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but I don't think he will. But he had gone to a, uh, a Jeet Kune Do seminar. And it was Dan Inasano and uh, Wing Chun instructor and another guy. And he, and he was there as an assistant of, I think it was Jean Jacques. Okay. And Jean Jacques taught the Jiu Jitsu portion. And then the Kali was taught and Wing Chun was taught. And after the, the Wing Chun class, uh, John Jock went over to the Wing Chun store. He's like, oh, that was, that was so fantastic. That was great. You know, if, if I was 20 years younger, I would learn that. I'd add it to my jujitsu. I'd be an unstoppable fighter. And it's that. It was very complimentary. And Chris, same background as us, had come from the Jeet Kune Do community, actually come from Dan and Sama right. school, and had given that up completely for jujitsu before we did. And... Um, so he's in the car and he's confused by that, was confused by that. And so they're driving and finally he looked at Jean-Jacques and he said, did you, did you really mean that about the, the Wing Chun and all that? And Jean-Jacques said, oh no, Chris, that's, that's all bullshit. You just need boxing and wrestling. I was just being nice. And I've thought about that story a lot. I think, well, is it really nice? Because there's a lot of people there at that event who, who take Jean-Jacques to be somebody who knows what he's talking about, right? And the ones that are least likely to get the inside joke of it are the ones that most need correct jujitsu. Correct. And they're the ones that are most likely to be led astray by that attempt to otherwise be nice. And I wonder, and it's my own something that I've thought about over the years, and, and I wonder if that's actually nice. Is that a nice? If you don't have to, and certainly not in front of a group, put down what another instructor was doing. But you certainly don't have to compliment something that was nonsense. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's really the crux of it, right? Uh, I'm trying to be a nice guy. I spent a lot of my time being less than a nice guy, and maybe I, the pendulum has swung too far back, and, I, and I'm, I need to find a healthy middle place. Uh, I think that, uh, man, it's, it's like a lot of people are delusional, and it, it doesn't... It doesn't help them to, you know, just say, yeah, that's just as good as everything else. I mean, if I, if I really, well, gosh, if I, if, like, you know, I can't, I can't imagine anyone I love more than my own daughter. I would always tell her the truth and I wouldn't let her do anything that stupid. And it's funny, it's maybe, maybe I'm, I'm actually being selfish and, and it's like because I don't love these or I don't feel connected or enough love for these people. I'm like, yeah, they can do whatever they want. It's cool. I think if I really came from a place of love and if I was like more committed as, a, as someone who was really out to help people find uh, the best path in martial arts, I would have to be like brutally honest with them and tell them like, all the, all the 1% caveats aside, just to be a nice guy again, I mean, all those caveats about, you know, culture, and you know, in, in other words, if you are the, the less than 1% who admits that what I'm doing is about as martial as flower arranging, but I just like Japanese culture, then I can't say anything to you. To the other 99%, I think, yeah, if, 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 I, if I would, if I, when, not if, when I, you know, find a way to be really honest, I just have to start telling these people, like, you're wasting your time. If, if you're after, if you're after something that is physically, and, and by extension, mentally healthy for you, you're wasting your time because uh, it's not that flower arranging can't be mentally healthy, but it's mentally unhealthy if you think that flower arranging is going to make you good at self defense. The, the, the bottom line is you two should work against everybody. And if it doesn't, it's not, it's, not, um, it's not wrong in the sense that you might win an IBJJF medal because it's like, oh, we're within 10 pounds of each other, we're within five years of each other, we're the same belt. We know the rules, we know the time limits, but that's one small subset of jiu-jitsu, right? A very, to me, not important. It can be important personally, but in the overall, and I'm not, so personal goals, it can be important, but in jiu-jitsu, not that important. So the question was, can I preemptively underhook his head if I like the basket, right? And I would say it's a big person who's technical, black belt, bigger than me, it's gonna be hard because I'm getting greedy, right? I'm, I'm trying to skip a step. So when he goes, I'm already thinking like I'm going to do this, and it's just a little bit too connected still. And I really, 
have to disconnect or break his connection before I think of my own offense. You know, I am on defense. He beat me here, right? He beat me here. Boom. I'm not getting this back. I have to accept that. So I'm on defense, right? I, it, it looks like I'm on offense, but we know jujitsu, and he's going to win if I, if I agree. So my first job is to have maximum base and disconnect. Now I'm back on offense, but I, I can't skip, skip this step. So then, yeah, if you like that, it's fine. So with that in mind, one more minute. One, two. Yeah, I wonder sometimes if, if the being polite about things that we, we know are not true right. is more of a case of indifference than it is politeness. I mean, it must be for me. And I, I, something I have to work on because, you know, uh, I, I was very clear earlier when I said, you know, these people who are willing to take a six-month or one-year hit in their gym wins or even tournament wins eventually become much better martial artists. And it's the same thing. If I, if I'm, I tell people that every day. Yeah. Quit doing that. It's bad for your jiu-jitsu. Right. Take a step back. Relax. Do real jiu-jitsu. And I promise you, you'll be better on the other end. Right. And I need to be willing to say, uh, to, to, that's a micro version, but I need to do that on the macro version, which is quit believing that bullshit will work because it won't. Take a step back. And you're going to you're gonna have to, your ego will take a hit because it's like, well, I've invested 17 years or... 17 months, it doesn't matter, in learning this stuff, and I want to show off, and I want to do this stuff because it looks cool, um, I would have to tell them, no, no, you, you really need to just kind of put it aside. You're going to go a little bit back for a little bit of time, but again, if you're doing this for the next, well, heck, I, I plan to be doing this for the next 40, 50 years, and a lot of the people I'm talking to are younger than I am. You know, 50, 60 years, what is, what is that loss of 17 months? Right, you know, in the long Right. I remember in the JKU days, this was, this was particularly true from Paul Van Eck's branch of Jeet Kune Do, but when they were pushed on the things that are, are silly, like the sombrata and, sure. and that kind of stuff, they said, well, okay, so the, the boxing and the jujitsu, that's for, for self-preservation. This, the clicking the sticks together, and this, this is for self-perfection. Sure. Also struck me, struck me as, as totally backwards because the character development part of jujitsu to seems obvious to me, comes from the struggle yes. of the, co the competitive aspect of what we do. Absolutely. Having to tap Absolutely. and having to uh, overcome your own ego, which non-existent when we're clicking sticks together Correct. and just trying to perfect a two-person choreographed form. It's actually worse than non-existent. It, it's kind of artificially inflated. Yes. Yeah. They wind up having to defend a position that's yeah. based on a falsehood, and they become even more yes. aggressive about it. When in reality, we both know that the, the long-term benefits as it relates to character within functional martial arts come as a direct result of the fact that they're functional. Yeah. And so I, I just, I have reached a point where I don't see a role for anything other than maybe us just being brutally honest with people. Right. Not for the intentions of hurting anyone's feelings, but because that's the best way to help people in general. And how else, how else would it work in your other field? If you did it any other way, can't work. You'd be going backwards. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then the last thing we're going to talk about is just the distinction of black belts. Yeah. So the distinction of black belts is is related to, but not totally overlapping with the distinction of jujitsu, right? Uh, the dis the distinction of doing good jujitsu would be the first prerequisite for getting a black belt. And that, and by the way, this is evolving. I haven't always been this way. I've given black. No, actually, I've gotten rid of two really bad guys at Brown Mill. I haven't given a black belt that I regret. Mind, just stop there for a second, because I've kicked people out at Brown Belt as well. You said you've just gotten rid of two people at Brown Belt, and I've had people criticize me for that. But I think it's really important to do that if you're a coach and an instructor, because our number one responsibility is the safety of the students in our environment. I wonder if you could just stop for a minute. You don't have to say yeah, personally why yeah. you did it, but why did you decide to Okay, do yeah. So the, these two guys uh, didn't have any, they weren't world champions, but they had no problem with, you know, their chokes and armor. They learned from me, they learned that part of Jiu-Jitsu from me, but that's all they learned from me. And, you know, by brown belt, I figure you've been with me somewhere between like six and ten years, depending on, you know, how hard you work and how gifted you are. And, uh, if, and I try to lead by example, and I try to be not really overt and be like, do this, do that, but kind of model the behavior I expect. 
uh, and they really simply, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years into the process, were, it just became clear to me that on the one hand, all they were there to do was learn chokes and arm bars, and their life off the mats was, you know, uh, the way they treated other men, the way they treated women, the, the way they, heck, the way they ordered food in a restaurant, you know, I'm, just, I'm with them all the time, and they just had poor character. You know, they were, they were rude and, and they had all kinds of problems with the way they dealt with people in the world. And, oh, you know, I just said, look, you know, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with, with your jujitsu as a fighting part. But, you know, philosophically, we're just not the same. You, you, I gave you a lot of time and I gave you a lot of examples and a lot of, a lot of chances. And you're not doing my, you're doing a jujitsu, but you're not doing my jujitsu. So if you're not doing my jujitsu, I can't give you a black. Right. Because they represent you, right? Correct. Yeah. And then SBG, and by extension, Hickson, and the whole you know, thing that I feel connected to. Yeah. That's a good point. So, the safety of the students on the mat is so important. And this person, for the rest of their life, once you hand them a black belt, is going to say, I'm a John Frankel black Correct. belt, or I'm a Matt Thornton black belt. That really character has to become a part of, yeah. an essential part of. of allowing people to reach that. that and way. it's really the last hurdle because after that it's kind of like, well, three years, now I'm first three, but six years, now I'm second year. Black belt forever. Kind of out of math, yeah. right? So it's the last time I can really intervene. Yeah. And I, and I, I don't, I, I mean, if someone's egregious, let's kick them out at white. But oh, yeah. like these guys I liked in a certain sense and, and they, I knew they were sincere about some kind, some part of jujitsu. Right. So I gave them as many chances as possible, but that's kind of the, where I have to draw the line. Right. Like if I, I'm not going to give a black belt or something like that. And uh, without even, before I, the first two black belts, actually, was the second and third black belt I gave. My first black belt, Steve Kaepner, is not a gym owner. He's a, he's a good friend, and he's a lifelong martial artist, and you know he's just doing it because he likes it. He's a professor in university. But the second and third black belts I gave were Koreans, and they're completely homegrown, they're my, my students, and they run gyms, and uh, this was one stage, I've, I've, I think I've evolved and I'm stricter now, but even then I had a concept of this, and I had two black belts, one that I would wear during the week to train by my university, and one that I'd wear on the weekends across the river, and they were worn out like this, and they looked kind of gray, and I'd been wearing them for a while, because by the time I gave those two black belts, I'd probably been black belt, like, you know, seven, eight years, and I had a brand new, whatever, a Tama or a Corral black belt in the plastic, and I had my own belt. And I said, you're a black belt. Like, you are a black belt in jiu-jitsu. That's not under dispute right now. But you have to decide if you're a John Frankel, SBG, Hickson, all the way up, black belt, or just a black belt. And I said, if I give you this black belt, which I wore for seven years and is all gray, then like you, we can argue and, and we, can, we can disagree, but it's like you can't leave any more than you can, like, I mean, you could leave, but it would be like, oh, I changed my last name to Smith. I could change my last name to Smith, but it wouldn't change my genetic makeup. It wouldn't change my parents and grandparents. I said, you take my belt, and then you're in the family, and we can fight all we want, but it's, it's an internal fight. Or you take this brand new shiny Atama black belt, and then you're just a black belt. It's acknowledging that you're good at chokes and arm bars, and you can do whatever you want. And they both took my old belts and they're both still with me and that's awesome and that was the first stage but I've become even stricter but it's something like jujitsu itself that I'm always refining trying to try to clean up my ideas on, on these standards uh, I'm much stricter now you know ten years later uh, and uh, now now I would give both those guys black belts by the way but the, the speech and the conditions might be a bit a bit different and actually uh, you know the shift, it wouldn't be less based on their ability, because I still am totally happy, even now, having someone who's a purple belt or brown belt for the rest of their life. Sure. It doesn't bother them. If it bothers them, they'll leave. If it doesn't, if it doesn't bother them, they'll stay. But I don't feel the need to promote everyone to black belt. Right. So if I do, the physical part of it is still the same as it always was. Sure. The standards are the same. Necessary. How, how good they have to be at fighting. Right. Necessary but not sufficient. Correct. The, the other part has grown. Anything else you can think of you want to add in? That was the last um, chance. I mean, I still, I still feel like I, did, I shortchanged you on uh, the JJD guy. 
We can go back and do it like three more times and you can pick all the most. Uh... Well, um, what is it you feel like you didn't say that you want to say? So I remember one of the first camps you came to, and was at my, my gym. It was the first camp, because I met you at Steve's seminar. <coughs> you came yeah. to a camp before that, I think, when we were in a hotel. Correct. I came as a guest, but it was the first camp I came as an SBG representative. Yeah, yeah. And we were at my gym on MLK. Yeah. You went into the bathroom to change. Yeah. You came out, you were wearing an Inosano Academy t-shirt. Correct. Uh, Muay Thai shorts. Yep. A sarong. Yep. Sweats. Yep. Spider coat clip it. Yeah, and a clip it. Yeah. What was that about? So it was an inside joke because, like we said, you got it and the people who were in that environment got it. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's a statement that it was just a, a funny but also very serious statement that it's like, don't, don't confuse uh, the decorations, you know, for the art. And don't, don't confuse all the, the bling, right, the flashy lights and the accessories and, and all that for what really matters. And, you know, it's a metaphor for life, right? Uh, people get so attracted to, oh, but I, I want to be a black belt, or I want to wear that color sarong, or I want to learn that knife disarm, or I, you know, when I get into that class, they'll put me in a, in a different t-shirt. And I was just having fun, because everyone at that time, all those years ago, not everyone, but most of the people got it. But it's still, it's still just as serious today. It's like there are still, uh, well, let's put it this way, there, there are traditional martial arts. And, you know, the guys in JKD don't get a pass because they uh, made an industry out of insulting those guys. Yes. They, they wrote books insulting those guys, yes. and they criticized how, how backward they were. Yes, that's um, the hypocrisy. Yeah, they, they criticized those guys, overtly. Yes. Uh, and so I was, it's, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the game. Side-by-side right? side comparisons right. and absorb what's yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, very blatant. And they were correct, actually. They were 100% correct. But, you know, it's like the king is dead, long live the king. Right. You know, they killed that king, but then they want to be the king. They now it's systemic. Right. And they, right. And they, but they don't, it's like, you know, uh, we'll evolve up to this point, but now there can be a, no other evolution, and no one needs, can surpass us. Right. And I was simply giving a very graphic and, and you know, simultaneously funny but very serious, uh, you know, representation of that. Like, okay. You were right, but you've become what you criticized. Right. And I can criticize that because, you know, it's, it's not like you were uh, quiet and saintly and kind about your position when you were trying to affect a certain revolution. But it's, I mean, we talked about Orwell. You know, it's always like, I want one revolution and then I want history to stop because we're perfect. Right. And it's like, no. It's a series of revolutions, and it never stops. And you know, this is what jujitsu did, and this is what MMA did. And, Everybody you know, wants to install a second golden calf. Right, right. So we we either uh, keep up with that, or we become fodder for side by side comparisons. Yes. Yeah. Very true. There we go. <laughs> you wanted that. That's I wanted, I wanted to say that too. Yeah. <laughs> but but you have to ask the right questions. You would draw me out. And I, I started picturing myself in the skirt, and I'm like, yeah, I got to talk. About this. this is weird. Yeah. No one else is going to say is laughing. No one else even knows. Say it. He won't say it. But like, in, in, aside from Howder, like a lot of people don't know. It. No. I think another important distinction that that you know my friends understand, but like people who may be a little offended by what I say might not understand is that uh, I was not uh, fanatical about jujitsu. I was fanatical about you know truth in martial arts. So I went to LA not only seeking out Hickson, but uh, the Inasano Academy and all the instructors there. And there and that was a buffet, right? Um, so uh, I did the Jun Fang classes, the, the Muay Thai classes, the Sila Filipino martial arts and on top of that, the uh, Shuto class. So part of what convinced me to, to focus more on Jiu-Jitsu uh, was not necessarily a comparison of, you know, is it better to grapple than to kickbox, for example. That's a separate question. Uh, it, it was doing grappling at two different places and realizing that one methodology, because I was you know, basically putting in relatively equal math time both places and feeling like here I learned 
100 techniques that, that I can't use, and here I learned five techniques, and I'm here. And then I learned 200 techniques, and then I learned five more techniques. And it wasn't, it was a, literally a matter of months, not years, a matter of like three or four months. Uh, and, and it doesn't get more empirical than just going into a class and rolling with people. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not a pro athlete. Um, I'm not a bad athlete, but I'm not gifted. And, you know, I just, you can't. There's nothing, there's, that's one of the beauties of jujitsu or any grappling art. It's like, someone chokes you. It's not like arguable. And someone arm locks you. Because uh, you're going to try to escape, but if you, if you tap, it's not really arguable. Um, and so I, I just had a really side-by-side, uh, -side, open mind, comparing them both in real time. Not, I'm going to quit this and do that, but really doing them together. And uh, the learning curve, uh, the kind of attitude of the people I was training with, uh, the way I felt when I was done, which is subjective but important, mm -hmm. the way I felt when I went into the shower, I mean, everything was just kind of organically pushing me towards jujitsu. Sure. The healthy way. Right. Something that's based in honesty. Yeah. What the other martial arts like Aikido pretend to be, but can't achieve because of pretending. Correct. Poor Sistema. Talking to you guys. <laughs> Russian Aikido. Russian Aikido. Yeah. I think that's good. The yeah. last part of you talking is honest, and that'll help you. The funny thing is, I really meant it. Like, it's it's weird to me to finally put you help me like concretize it. But why would I have an, a way easier time telling this to my daughter than it would? Because I love her. Because <laughs> because I care about her welfare for the right. next fifty years, or right. seventy years. And it's like, wow, maybe maybe I'm actually doing him a disservice. Maybe I don't care about him, right? Right, and the people that you're going to be talking to that will watch the podcast will be potentially, and they, these days in a day and age, could be students of our students or yeah. students of your kids. Yeah, you have to think about that. Like, what's is it more important that maybe Ricky Davison's students or Stella's students or the students of her students get to hear you talk about that than what she thinks about it? Two million times more important. Right. Yeah. Right. Now you got me all fired up. Do you think I said enough? You got me all ready. Oh, to go you now. say, man. You got more to say. You say. You, got me, you got me all ready to go. Breathing tight. So, uh, this is the part of the seminar where it's kind of natural for me to, to say something I say in most seminars. Uh, this technique, I can teach you this technique and 100 more techniques, and none of them are going to work unless your white belt did to it. You, you know, when you're shrimping, so you shouldn't be thinking, I already know that, this is too basic, this isn't fun. It's like, pro golfers putt hundreds of times a day. Pro basketball players shoot under free throws every day or a thousand or whatever, they're, you know. You're not, you're, you're never done with those things and, and they're important. So this is, this looks cool um, and you'll do it now because your partner's letting you and if you have a bad shrimp, it won't. You can, you can learn it from me, you can watch people more famous than me on YouTube all day, it won't work. It all comes down to shrimp, bridge, technical get up. That's what makes everything work. So, you know, warm ups are really productive in that sense, assuming your coach doesn't have you aware of the warm ups. But if you're doing jiu jitsu based warm ups, it's really important. If your body doesn't do everything you want it to do alone, it's certainly not going to do it when someone's 200 pounds is cross phase. So uh, this whole technique is just body control, that's all it is. I've never pushed Michael or pulled Michael, right? It's just me connecting and having a good bridge, him disconnecting, me reconnecting and having a good shrimp. The push is simply because when he tries to come back, I'm not going to let him. But the space was gained from my shrimp, right? This is just a frame. But without without a good bridge and shrimp, nothing works. Even, even the things that look fancy, they're all built upon three or four foundational you know, movement patterns. And tomorrow, back escape, we're basically going to do one movement pattern for all our back escapes. Because under pressure, the more things you're thinking about, the more time for your partner to tap you, right? 
And if you just have an ingrained reflexive movement pattern that works in all these different situations, it's going to be a lot more efficient, particularly under pressure. This is SBG, and you will be okay.